Okay, let's start. Uh, good morning, everybody. Nice to see you again. Uh, I forgot uh, a few things yesterday. I was, I was actually promising somebody that I should give a small introduction to the event management program, but uh, to avoid uh, spending the sport management students' time, I will do this in the first break. Okay, um, and there was something else I forgot. Um, there is actually a Facebook group for this course. Some of you have already found it, I think. Um, uh, if you go into Facebook, uh, I have to log on perhaps. No disregard my personal Facebook message now, okay? You'll have to see them for a moment, okay? Okay, let's search for uh, IDR720. Yeah, you see there is a public group here. Um, Veronica, you're alre already a member. Maybe that's not you. That's you. Yeah. How did you become a member? Uh, actually, I really don't know. I was just looking for some. I don't know. You remember? Did I allow you to be a member? Uh, yeah, but I found it on Twitter. Yeah. Okay. So this is a group you can. Uh, you just go in here and you ask to be a member, and either some students can allow you or I can do it. Okay. I think it should work like that. So, uh, do you have a computer, Farnar? Farnir? Far? Farnar, uh. can you try to? I did. You did? Uh. Did you? Uh, but uh, you have to apply to. Uh, it's, pe it's pending. It's pending? Yeah, so you have to accept me. I have to accept you. Yeah, then I should get a message, shouldn't I? Maybe it come up here. Uh. Yeah? Okay, then I do, do this this and this suddenly there are three new, new members okay you see how it works okay I get a message I allow you you can't find it you don't find the group oh. did you search for IDR 720 I don't know it will help you he is a computer wizard Yeah, suddenly we get we are getting more. Uh, yeah, now we are adding. Uh, ah, even four new members. So Kelly, did it did it sort out? Yeah. Okay. Isabel. Yeah, that's you. You added mm. Ka Kelly. Is added? Yeah. Yeah. Karu. Who's that? That's, That's you. Okay. You have a. Just type, uh, and it's our Finnish uh, Maria. There you are. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Maria. Okay. Uh, we can keep on doing this. <laughs> okay. Capital yeah. Capital letters. I D R seven twenty. The idea with this group, uh, I assume you understand it, is that uh, basically you can discuss stuff. I will monitor the group, and if my uh, vast knowledge is needed, I might interfere and uh, say something, okay? Of course, you can ask questions here to each other. Oh, we get more uh, people. Yeah, I need to gather up all here. Yeah, okay, that one was fixed. This is a different stuff, yeah, okay. So you like my picture? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is that the Georgia Bulldogs Stadium? Stanford Stadium? The picture? Yeah, it's in America, yes. That's my school. That's your school? Yeah. Very big stadium, isn't it? 93,000 seats. Yeah, one of the biggest in the world then. 
Nice to see. Yeah. Best picture, man. I think this is from a Manchester United game, actually. Although I'm not sure. No, it's American football. It's it is. There's lines on the field. Yeah, but you know, yeah, maybe, maybe you're right. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. Okay, I, I, ex <laughs> I, I expect your, ex I, I accept your expertise here, Matt. And we have to add some more here. Okay. Yeah, we, we don't need to spend time on this, okay? But uh, the point is, as I said, you can be a member of this group and there is uh, the option of discussing with your st other students as well as me, okay? So uh, that was that one. Then there is a bit more tricky thing here, which I also forgot. Even though I said that we are videotaping this, of course, you need to get some notion of where to find these videos, okay? Uh, the simple way to do that is, of course, to just to go to YouTube and do a search for something which may be relevant, uh, although you don't know what to search for. Maybe you should try H I Molde. Let's see what happens then. And you see, we get up a page here on top, which is the basic uh, YouTube page for the college. And if you go in here, you oh, Jesus Christ, it's even sound here. Um, you see, we have a lot of videos here. These are really not the videos that should interest you. There are other videos. So you have to change your search string here into HI Molde X, actually. Because we have a site called HI Molde X, which kind of takes care of all the video communication between the college and the students. So let's do that instead. No, Jesus Christ, here it is, this one. Unfortunately, it's only Norwegian, okay? So what it says here is, uh, hi Molde X, open video from Molde University College. That's the meaning of these crazy Norwegian letters, okay? So if you go in here, all the, ah, all the available videos for all courses are here, okay? Hopefully, the videos for this course will come up. Here you can see something, can't you? It seems uh, yesterday's taping worked to some extent, okay? Let's try to see if it worked. I do that, please. Yeah, I'm constantly going out of focus, it seems. It's a good uh, thing to put it on at 180p here to, to get a better quality. What's your name? Ha <laughs> ha! Yeah, you see it works, okay? Where are you from? So, um. And the other girl? From France. From France, okay. Okay, we don't need to spend time on this as well. Uh, there come is. Forward, girl. Come ah, forward. come forward, girls. Ah, uh, sorry about this, okay? I try to behave now, okay? To make nice videos. Uh, the idea is, of course, as I told you yesterday, that this gives you the option of following this course without actually being here, okay? You may be sick, maybe other reasons. Uh, so hopefully this uh, can be a nice aid for you. Uh, this is the brutal way of going into this, going straight into YouTube and search, okay? But uh, we have, of course, a kind of, should we say, better way of accessing this content, more structured. But as I said, unfortunately, this is only Norwegian, but let's have a look at it anyway, okay? Then we have to look at the Norwegian page of the homepage of the university. Uh, although you probably don't understand anything here, you should mark this one, HIMOLDEX. If you click that one, you get into the structure set here. Of course, everything is in Norwegian. But uh, there are two labels here, 44 and 25. This 25 label contains all courses where videos are available at the moment. These numbers are constantly changing, so hopefully more and more. So if you click here, you get um, uh, video stuff, which is already here now. And you see my name here, so if you just click my name, you get all the courses I have which are available either with video or also without video. 
So you see here, uh, for instance, here's the course I gave last year. And if you go in here, uh, there is something about the course here, the intro some, some even in English here. There is, if you go here, you go straight into Frontier as a guest. So if you forget your front Frontier password, you can always go through here to get into it. And here is uh, a list of all the videos. So here you see in lectures, dates, names, what they're about and so on. You can just click here to go straight into the lecture. The idea is, of course, that this course will be structured the same as we move along. OK. Any questions about this? You understand? Straightforward? OK. I did ask you, I think, uh, yesterday on whether you found this to be a problem. I didn't really get any feedback on that. So if you think it's OK, then we just keep on doing this. OK. So I have to go here to get into front. Has everybody gotten necessary computer credentials? Are you, are you able to get into the systems? And is everything clear? OK. Have you gotten an email account? OK. It's your, your first name, dot last name, at himolde.no. Stud. OK, so it's a stud in front. S-T-U-D, which is an abbreviation for the Norwegian student. Uh, student in English. So it, it should kind of work, shouldn't it? In, even internationally. Yeah. OK, ah, oh, I did a mistake, didn't I? Anybody see what mistake I made? I have to remember here to use English, OK? We are not speaking Norwegian here. OK. So today we will actually start teaching this textbook. Before I do that, I think uh, perhaps I should uh, maybe you can take up the take up the the front page here. <coughs> it's the course uh, lectures uh, open. Yeah, as we said yesterday, we start from the beginning and uh, move ahead. Uh, the textbook which we are teaching from is what we could say and um, not the easiest textbook on or in microeconomics, but by far not the toughest one. So this is kind of something in between. Okay. Uh, roughly, uh, a tough textbook in microeconomics would be very mathematically oriented. This one is really not that. Okay? Although there is some parts which use mathematics, there are not very many of them and they are not very large. So uh, hopefully this, this textbook should be possible for you to read if you choose to buy it, although it was quite expensive as I understood. Uh, there is, however, some peculiar peculiarities with this textbook. Uh, it um, it kind of opens up telling uh, almost the whole story. So in the, the first chapter, actually, they kind of introduce demand curves, they introduce supply curves, they introduce the general equ equilibrium already at the start without actually making much explanations. So if you are slightly confused, by the first chapter, that is to some extent perhaps the intention by the author here. So when we move on, we will kind of start building the traditional explanation in microeconomics. And the traditional course in microeconomics goes like this. Okay, We start with consumers. We use utility functions to describe each consumer. Then we assume, should we say, greedy consumers. They would like to achieve a maximum amount of utility. Based on that, we can derive demand curves for individual consumers. We do what we refer to as utility maximization. So we let each cons consumer choose between a set of goods. 
and then kind of arrange the number of apples and pears he, he wants to buy uh, to uh, based on that argument and those necessary assumptions we arrive at an individual demand curve for each consumer then we start talking about markets and we assume okay there is this uh, there is a certain amount of consumers we kind of have to aggregate them or put them together and then they kind of constitute the market we look at and then we can derive a market demand curve then we move to the producers or which we often call suppliers in microeconomic theory so we have the consumers on one side those who buy products and the producers or suppliers on the other side th those who produce it of course in practice or in real in the real world there is an overlap here isn't it every pro producer is a consumer and in principle every consumer is also a producer through his labor okay so even though in practice these two groups are mingled together we kind of separate them when we think here then as i said we move into the suppliers and we make some assumptions about suppliers we assume for instance that they are profit maximizers they want, want to earn as much money as possible based on that we can derive supply curves and then finally we make arguments on why we then can say that uh, the general equilibrium is the intersection between demand and supply that can be done in many ways these textbooks does it relatively easy but as i said there are more complex ways of doing this argument after that we start talking about other cases in economic theory for instance monopoly you know what a monopoly is a situation where you have a single producer and basically an infinite amount of consumers okay that is one kind of point in economic space. The other extreme is the general equilibrium. In that case, we have an infinite number of producers uh, as well as an infinite number of consumers. Okay. So uh, to start here, we can kind of say that we have a line here. Okay. We have the general equilibrium and we have monopoly. And the situation is that in the gener general equilibrium setting, we have producers and oh sorry, consumers. My writing is not very nice. We often call these suppliers as well. And there is an infinite amount here and an infinite amount here. You're fam familiar with this sign, aren't you? An eight number turned around means infinite. Do you know what infinity really means? No, perhaps not. It's not so easy to understand, is it? In this case, the supplier producer and consumer is slightly different. We assume an infinite number of consumers here and just a single supplier. Okay, that's kind of the extreme points. Reality is typically somewhere in between here, isn't it? Of course, in practice, you will never have an infinite number of any of these groups, okay? So hopefully some of these markets are so big that we can kind of approximate the, the finite number of agents into believing that it, uh, it should work. So real-world economy is always in between here, basically. But still, it's important and interesting to know these extreme cases. And that's kind of the main point of a course in microeconomics. Everything in between here it's actually game theory and normally you don't treat game theory much in a standard course in microeconomics uh, but uh, maybe we should spend a little time on it because in the markets that should interest us sports and event markets uh, these assumptions about infinity here is uh, even harder to grasp than in other markets okay you know perhaps that uh, At the moment, there is one of the players at the local team who is, there is rumors that he's going to be sold to Turkish football. His name is Martin Linnes, and he's uh, quite a good young player. Uh, and of course, this process of kind of understanding whether he will be sold at what price and so on is not so easy to fit into these extreme cases, is it? There is a buying club and a selling club, and 
maybe the selling club knows more about the player than the buying club for instance that is something which creates complications here it could uh, uh, affect whether he is sold or at what price he is sold and typically there is not an infinite number of buyers here it's ju typically just a single one or maybe two or three possible clubs and this of course creates problems when it comes to understanding what will and may happen so be aware of this okay we just we, we buy finally actually by a kind of standard course in microeconomics we, we only simply scratch the top of the iceberg here okay reality is by far much more complex and much more involved and modern economic theory is a lot about applying game theory into market setting different market settings okay almost around half of all Nobel prizes in economics handed out in the let's say at least since 94 20 years have been given to game theory economic theory so to speak uh, often we, we use a word called industrial organization have you heard that word it seems to have something about how to organize industry but really it doesn't mean that what it actually means is is economic theory where you apply game theory so if you run into this term industrial organization it doesn't really mean what you think it would okay it uh, means of course there are problems related into that area that deals with real industrial organization how to organize stuff but it's kind of a misleading term so we are starting at the bottom here <coughs> moving slowly okay but be aware of that sport and event markets are perhaps markets which which are more much more closer to the center here than other markets okay so at the moment we have kind of argued or at least I have said to you that in a general equilibrium we have an infinite number of suppliers and an infinite number of consumers that means that these markets that should kind of be we tend to call these market efficient markets and that's the reason for that as well we will return to that later in the course hopefully it has something to do with whether you're able to 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 set the correct price in the market um, obviously these markets must have many agents at least you know. even though they are not infinite it should be large markets okay so if I were to ask you if you were to pick one world market, which one would you think should be closest to the left part here, to the what we have referred to as the general equilibrium? So, or let me rephrase the question: What kind of would be the largest market market you can think of? Oh, we have car markets, we have uh, grocery markets, we have food markets, we have, we have all kinds of markets. Okay. So, what do you think uh, would be the market that should be closest to being? in a general equilibri equilibrium maybe food market, maybe food market. Yeah, can yeah, everybody eats okay maybe 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 not no. of course there's not a general food market is it it's markets for peas for apples for pears so there's kind of a lot of sub markets here you uh, you can think of but in in practice these markets are kind of separated into sub markets mm -hmm. okay so Norway sell fish uh, Brazil sells coffee and so on okay so so and these sub markets are kind of isolated of course they are linked to the other markets if people get less money they buy less food and so on but uh, I don't think uh, the food markets are those who are closest to the general equilibrium do you have any other suggestions yes from uh, what was your name again from Uganda Monica. Monica what did you want to bring to us uh, perhaps oil and gas, perhaps oil and gas. Oil and gas markets could have been general equilibrium mo uh, markets, but they are not. Do you know why? Matt, you have something. They came together to like yeah. Uh, sure that yeah, very good, uh, Matt. You know all this already, don't you? Yeah. Did you hear what he said? They are going together. So they're kind of making a coalition, as we call it, or an alliance, to try to affect the market. The idea of a general equilibrium market is that nobody can affect the market. That's the idea. Okay? As long as there's an infinite amount, even if you try to construct a coalition, it's not possible because there's always an infinite amount of people who is not in the coalition. Okay? That's kind of the definition here. Yes? And I guess labor markets? 
labor markets. But again, of course, labor markets is like food markets. Don't they? they kind of, yeah, there's teachers, doctors, football players, and so on. So they, they kind of get small within how they, they work. Yes? Ah, what was your name? Thomas. Thomas. Okay, that's a good uh, choice, isn't it? Financial markets. They're kind of global, they kind of cover everything, and they're kind of, of course, there's different financial markets. There's stocks, there's bonds, there's warrants, there's derivatives, and so on. Okay, but uh, still, most experts would predict that financial markets are those who should be closest to general equilibrium. But still, they are not always close to as well, aren't they? Because we see cases of insider trading, don't we? People try to cheat these markets. They try to keep information which the market should have, OK? So these are kind of the carnal questions of economic theory, how to kind of keep these markets as efficient as, as possible, try to make them work, so to speak. Try to avoid that people cheat each other. That's, in a sense, what you will try to do, to regulate markets. Regulating markets is difficult. It is perhaps a paradox, isn't it, that those markets who really have the strongest reg regulations, those markets are the financial markets, aren't they? they? They really are tough, at least in the United States, where you, you see a lot of Convictions related to insider trading, for instance, so they, they keep these, although those are the markets, you should really not need to be that structured. But these other markets, the sports markets, for instance, the regulations is almost not there. So you, so you really should expect that uh, sport and event markets are very special. Okay. few words on economic theory. I've already said a little bit, okay, but in general we can divide economic theory into two distinctly different subfields. One we tend to call microeconomics, the other one macroeconomics. Has anybody ever had a course in macroeconomics here? Matt has, and you, okay. Matt, what can you tell us about macroeconomics? What is, what's, what's it about? It's dangerous to raise your hand here. A very good explanation. Less about individuals, more about aggregate. Okay, so you can kind of think of, of macroeconomics as a kind of top-down approach on economy, while microeconomics is more like a bottom-up approach. Do you think that is a sensible way to say it, Matt? Yeah. Yeah, so in macroeconomics, you kind of look at economy as it kind of appears, okay? You observe prices, interests, investments, all kind of stuff, okay? And you, you observe these numbers, you make regression models on them. Do you know what a regression model is? Ah, no, okay. So you make some kind of mathematical models on it that you can kind of tie them together and try to predict what will happen when things change. But you really don't ex try to explain the real reasons for, for what happens and why it happens. You, you kind of don't put intelligence into the agents that construct the markets. You just observe them. Okay? But in microeconomics, you try to do that. You try to build intelligence into the agents and let the agents act based on this intelligence and then see what happens. The problem with this approach, which obviously is the best, isn't it? This is how you really should do it. The problem is that it becomes extremely complicated. You have to make a lot of approximations, assumptions which are not good, and then you kind of end up sometimes in silly models which uh, really don't predict reality good. So it's this kind of trade-off here between trying to understand how reality works, doing it silly, or trying to doing it sensibly without understanding how reality works. Okay? I like this because uh, I think it's a better plan, so to speak. Although the complexity makes it difficult. Okay, under these two major partitions, as we do here, there's kind of subgroups of different economic structures. For instance, sports economics. That is a, a separate area. Event economics could be a separate area, although it's perhaps not. Okay? 
sports economics has kind of grown out. In some things, there is journals, Journal of Sports Economics, for instance. Uh, the event side has kind of put the word management after. Do you know the difference between management and economics? <coughs> yeah, you know, in management, you typically don't use math. Okay, it's more like a social science approach in general. But in economics, you kind of use it math. So it, it kind of deals with the same thing, but uses different tools. Down here, of course, there are also groups, okay? It's international macroeconomics, it's uh, fiscal, it's financial and so on, okay? So it's a lot of different groups. The, uh, the, the reason why we kind of have these subgroups is, of course, that the markets we look at here, they behave differently, okay? There, there's substantial and structural differences that you can kind of believe should last, and then you kind of opens up for, you have to do things slightly, or in some cases, majorly different. and. Uh, as a consequence, it seems reasonable to have these subgroups. You know, there's something called resource economics, for instance, dealing typically with uh, you know, mining and oil and so on. Uh, there is forestry economics. It's health economics, for instance, a very big field, maybe the biggest subgroup of them all. And there's a lot of this, these uh, subgroups. So, so this is kind of how economic theory is put together as a scientific field. Okay. Now we talk about microeconomics here. We do not talk about microeconomics, so, so we, we stick to that. Okay. Uh, there are some decisions. You, you probably saw on the previous page here that uh, microeconomics explains behavior of individual economic units, consumers, producers, investors, and so on. And, uh, it at least tries to explain how and why these units make decisions, and that is that. So we're, we're focusing on the decisions here. Individual or groups decisions. How do these decisions, uh, how are they made, or actually how should they be made, perhaps? And there are some typical decisions here which are kind of focused in microeconomics. The consumer's purchasing decisions, okay? Uh, we all make transactions every day, don't we? At least if we have money, okay? We use this money to interchange it into products. And these products could be solid, like this chalk, or it could be less solid, watching a movie, downloading a computer game from internet. Of course, it needs transactions. You, you can avoid these transactions if you do it like a pirate. Some of us do that from time to time, but in general, it's not legal, is it? Yeah, in Norway, we are not... Uh, we don't have many cases here, but in the States, there are kind of these number of cases are growing, okay? If you download music, you can get uh, high fines, okay? At least there's been an example of it. So the question is then, uh, if I have a set, uh, I have some money, and I want to, to, to spend this money, how do, how do I spend it? What do I buy? When do I buy it? How much do I buy? These kind of decisions are, of course, important. Because they kind of describe the basic building block of economic theory. Okay, that's uh, to kind of explain how these transactions take place is, is obviously necessary to understand economics. And we may be suspicious, don't we, that these consumer decisions, they affect the market. For instance, they should affect the market prices, shouldn't they? If a lot of people are queuing up outside the doctor's office, if the doctor is greedy, then what would he do? Ah, maybe we shouldn't use the doctor. Maybe we should use ano another example. Okay, let's take uh, let's, let's take the solicitor instead. Okay, Solic solicitors are allowed to be greedy. Doctors are not. Okay. A solicitor, he, he, he sells uh, legal services to people, and uh, of course, if there is a very special solicitor here, he has a large queue outside his office, and if the solicitor is greedy, what could he do? Charges yeah, he can increase the prices, can't he? He should in perhaps increase the prices exactly to the moment where the queue disappears. In that case, of course, he gets his greediness is realized, he gets more money, more profits. 
So obviously there must be some link here between these consumer decisions and market prices. That is a very interesting link in microeconomics. How does the consumer choices affect market prices? The third point here is related to the labor market. Okay, Labor market is an interesting separate market and it's kind of a very important market because it, it uh, describes the most important input to the suppliers. Don't it? The su suppliers need labor to make the supplies and how labor market works is important in many instances. Most of us know that uh, high unemployment is a problem. Most of us does perhaps not know that low unemployment also is a problem. Why is that a problem? Yeah, you, you get um, lazy workers in a sense, or maybe you don't. Uh, somebody at least says that, okay? If, if everybody gets a job, why what incentive do you have to do a good job? And in that case, of course, if there is no unemployment, you don't get this mechanism to work, really. You should, most experts would say you should have a, a slight amount of unemployment, definitely not a high, high, high amount of unemployment. But you, you could, should really not have zero unemployment, and you kind of then things start to change, and you kind of miss. If you think of the consumers as selling their labor here, of course you miss this infinity thing because then it's kind of and there's uh, room for everybody. Then uh, the possibility of alliances and that kind of thing will will be there. So hence, how firms decide the number of workers is important, and what kind of mechanisms. Defines. We, ha we have some feeling for this question, don't, don't we? If, uh, if the market is good, okay, and it's a kind of growing business, then they would hire more, okay? So the, and they would typically hire more workers. If workers get cheaper, for instance, if a Norwegian company takes its business and moves down to Latvia, getting more cheap labor, pr probably they would hire more than they would do in Norway. These kind of mechanisms are, of course, important. From the other, point of view, how workers decide where to work and how much work to do is yes, of course equally important. This is kind of we, okay? When you finish your master, what choice do you make related to getting a job? Some of us may feel that we didn't have a choice. <laughs> we, we got one job and we keep st stayed to that, but uh, some have had different stories. So, of course, there's always a lot of decisions to ma be made here individually when it comes to what work you choose to take and what work you do not choose to take. <coughs> and, of course, finally, interaction between economic units, forming markets and industries. And, of course, when we talk about markets here, it, it's kind of there is several people working in this market to produce these products. There may be several units or factories or companies that is involved in this market. For instance, in Norway, uh, we, we sell a lot of uh, fish, which is farmed. You know what fish farmed is? Farmed fish, yeah. Typically, it's salmon. It's made all around the coast here. And of course, there are several firms here producing the feed for the fish, producing the fish itself. Transporters kind of transport this, this fish out of Norway to different markets in France and in Italy and in China and so on, Japan. So all these, these, these kind of big chain must be, be understood in order to understand how it works and of course, as most economists would say, how it could be expected to continue to work. That's the most interesting question. Is it what will happen here? Okay. Any questions here? So far, so so good, I think. Now there is some important concepts here. The first one here says allocation of scarce resources, and then, then there is a reference to uh, Rolling Stones tune. Have you heard this tune? You can't always get what you want. Uh, it's it's an old tune, isn't it? I think it's from the late sixties or something. So I'm surprised that any of you ever, ever heard it, but the Rolling Stones, they are still going strong, aren't they? I find that kind of ridiculous, these old guys dancing on the stage, don't you? you? I assume you find it even more ridiculous. You are young, okay? Doesn't it seem kind of crazy? 
So why do they do it, do you think? I think it's because they earn a lot of money on it, actually. I can't foresee that I would love to be touring the world when I was 70 years old. At least not me. Maybe some of you could. But, uh, so it must be the money here. So this is a classical example, in my opinion, why economic theory is important. It can explain why Mick Jagger actually tours the world still. Of course, some would, or he would say, I love the music. I love to express my feelings to the world. Okay, that would be his answer. That would not be my answer. Okay, now we can always argue this. Okay. So this is kind of the root of economic theory, and it's the concept of scarce resources. Scarce resources are resources which we, which are limited. Okay. What about air? Is that a scarce resource? A scarce resource. We have to, we need air, don't we? We breathe it. Is it scarce? Mm, not scarce, but uh, it, some said it place to get good air. It's yeah, there's something called good air, isn't it? If you go up in the mountains in Norway, you say, ah, the air is nice. But that's kind of a feeling, isn't it? You really don't know whether it's nice, do you? There's a lot of medical science that needs to establish whether it's more healthy to live in the mountains in Norway than in Moscow or Detroit, for that matter. Of course, we probably know that it's slightly healthier than, than in Moscow or in Detroit because there is some pollution there. But, uh, but in most cases, resources are scarce. Okay, there is some limits to stuff. I, at least in the sense, of course, you can always produce more cars. But in, if you kind of extend in the car production enormously, then of course some boundaries will kind of will have to cut in. One type of resources which are obviously scarce is, for instance, petroleum, which is kind of natural resources, which are limited by themselves, they are scarce. This does not mean that we cannot produce artificial petroleum. Of course we can. Although Hitler produced almost all his gasoline artificially during the war. At first in the, the latter parts, when he were able to conquer R R Romania, that he was able to actually get the real stuff. So there is nothing like that, but still there is a scarcity about everything. If there is no scarcity, why would we need economic theory then? If everything is free and available, then we'd, we wouldn't need money, would we? It wouldn't be necessary with transactions. So money and transactions and scarce units is kind of the building block. That must be there. If you don't have that, then there is no economic theory. So this is kind of a basic statement, OK? If we pair that with greed, then we get economic theory. I think it's time for a break, uh, maybe two minutes more. Yeah. So there is scarce resources, OK? And then the economic basic question is kind of how to utilize these scarce resources. Should we leave it to the market? Should the politicians make the decisions? Or should we find something in between? Whatever, OK? How to kind of utilize these scarce resources. Then there's a, a term there. There's actually a typo there. It says, it says trade-offs. It should be trade-offs. Sorry about that, OK? The second one there, it should be trade-offs. Does anybody of you know what a trade-off is? It's kind of a common term to some extent. I know, Matt, you know it, don't you? Do you like to tell us? Yeah, maybe, maybe not. Um, I would say that the trade-off is a situation where there is some kind of opposing forces. Let me take an example. <coughs> Let's take a logistics example. Okay. Now, if you if you sell some goods, okay, and you you have the option of either kind of buying a lot from your supplier. In that case, if you buy a lot from your supplier, okay, then you put this on your storage and you start selling it to your customers. Okay. The nice thing about this strategy is that you don't have to buy so often because there is some costs involved in this buying process. Okay, you have to call up and you have to write invoices and all this kind of stuff. Okay, that there is a certain cost involved in each time you make this buying decision. 
So if you just buy a huge amount of goods, put them to storage, then you avoid all these buying stuff. But there is a problem with this, uh, uh, isn't it? Because if you buy a lot, then you would incur what to refer to as storage costs. Okay. Suppose you sell computers. If you buy a million computers one year, of course you know that in the next year these computers may not sell as good, okay? Because compet competitive computers have come up. So that's uh, one obvious reason for not buying this big amount. And this is a trade-off, isn't it? There's one force here telling you it's nice to buy, sell them, but there's another force saying you it's, it's not nice to buy, sell them, okay? That is what we refer to as a trade-off. A trade-off constructs an optimization problem, doesn't it? Somewhere in between here, depending on these costs, there must be a point where it's optimal for us to do this. So trade-offs are important because they construct optimization problems. They, they kind of, all economic problems should be trade-off. If there's not a trade-off, then it's not important. Okay, then you either do everything or nothing, so to speak. So if you can, keep on earning money okay, by doing something, then you just do that an infinite am amount of times to produce what we call a money pump. Okay, now it's time for a break. Then we hit the button here. <laughs>